So um, I'd like to first start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to this important uh, event and of course wish Boris many, many years of uh, uh, productivity and, uh, and happiness. In this talk, I'd like to tell you about some of the recent work, this is unpublished work, uh, that we've been doing to explore the interplay between a superconductor and, uh, and, a, and a semiconductor that has a very strong spin-orbit interaction in it. Uh, we're going to be exploring mostly the in-plane in magnetic field effects on this induced superconductivity inside the semiconductor. And what I'll show is that the induced pairing uh, consists of uh, finite momentum. Uh, this momentum that the pair acquire uh, is controllable in these systems. Uh, furthermore, the order parameter uh, oscillates in space, and uh, the oscillations in the order parameter in space could be both uh, perpendicular to the contacts as well as uh, parallel to them. And, and uh, we understand quite well right now what the different regimes are. Uh, and finally, we can uh, look at the data and understand under what conditions is uh, the effect of spin orbit interaction dominant in this system versus just plain Zeeman. The work that I'll be talking about was done by uh, three graduate students in my group, Sean Hart, Hetchen Wren, and Michael Kosovsky. Uh, the theory was uh, derived in collaboration with Bert Halperin, and this work is done in uh, close collaboration with the group of Lawrence Mullenkamp, uh, who has provided us with materials as well as a lot of the um, uh, a very good collaboration on how to fabricate these samples uh, that is being developed in parallel in both groups. So the material system that we're looking at is that of uh, mercury telluride, cadmium telluride, quantum wells. Uh, just very briefly, uh, historically these materials were introduced uh, in, in order to demonstrate uh, the first topological insulator demonstrating quantum spin hall effect. I'll mention that very, very briefly, but this is certainly not the topic of this talk. Um, so mercury telluride itself, here you see the band structure, is a semi-metal. Uh, it has the p orbitals uh, sitting above the s-type orbitals in the, in the band structure, but nonetheless it's not a semiconductor. And so in order to generate a semiconductor out of mercury telluride, you sandwich it between barriers of cadmium telluride, and you see the effects here. This is a sandwich structure. And if the width of this mercury telluride sandwich between the conventional semiconductor cadmium telluride is narrow, then this inversion that appears in mercury telluride gets undone, and the electron states reside above the hole-like states. This occurs for very short uh, well widths, less than 6.3 nanometers. Uh, but as you increase the well width, what happens is that you can uh, reach a situation where band inversion occurs nonetheless, but a true gap occurs because of science quantization. And here you see that uh, in this specific situation, the conduction band consists of hole-like states, very close to the bottom of the band, and the valence band consists of electron-like states, so this is the inverted uh, type of structure, and this is why this 2D material is a 2D topological insulator, and it supports a quantum spin hall uh, effect when the chemical potential is set into the gap. The focus of this talk, however, will be uh, at chemical potentials that are in the conduction band. We will tune density, but we're not really interested in the quantum spin hall nature of this thing just to understand what the interplay of superconductivity and spin orbit in this material will be. Here's a schematic of how the device looks. We pattern out of this quantum well uh, a MESA structure, <coughs> namely re we remove the quantum well everywhere except in this green region. We have these superconducting contacts that are these gray, uh, gray contacts here. They make reasonably well superconducting contacts to the 2D electron system. And then we deposit also a gate that allows us to look at this induced superconductivity in this geometry as a function of carrier density. And note that the gate covers the two electrodes so that we can induce rather a uniform change in density as best as we can. Now the knob that we'll be, or the tool that we'll be exploring is a simple Fraunhofer interferometry. Namely, we're going to look at supercurrent flowing through this device between two superconducting contacts.
and a narrow uh, strip of the semiconductor here, just the 2D electron gas. Uh, and we're going to look at, this, at the critical current as a function of perpendicular flux. And I want to emphasize the role of this flux is just to generate the Fraunhofer interferometry. It is not playing any important role in terms of its alignment of spins and so on. It's very weak magnetic fields on the scale of a few millitesla that we're exploring with a perpendicular field. Parallel fields will be very large, very large in the Tesla range. Uh, and so you see that uh, this is just a canonical case. In the absence of any parallel magnetic field, you see that uh, if you look at the critical current uh, or zero resistance in this system as a function of the DC current, you see that it's very large uh, when the flux is zero. And then you get this traditional Fraunhofer interferometry that corresponds to uniform current flow through this channel. And here is uh, the corresponding current flow distribution through the structure as analyzed from this Fraunhofer pattern. Uh, so I want to emphasize that here what has been measured is basically zero resistance, for example, along this cut up until this point where finite resistance develops. And that allows us to determine what the critical current is uh, as a function of perpendicular magnetic field. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, okay, so as we are going to apply relatively large magnetic field in plane, and we're going to study two superconducting materials, aluminum and niobium, uh, I want to convince you, especially with aluminum that has a relatively low TC, uh, HC1, that if you make very thin aluminum contacts and you apply a magnetic field in the plane of that film, that the superconducting critical field uh, of the aluminum film could be very, very high. And here you see a very old result from 1971. As you reduce the film thickness down to 10 nanometers, for example, the critical field can exceed several tesla. And this parallel to the film, exactly, parallel to the film. Uh, and here are measurements of uh, just two contact resistance measurement of each one of the leads showing indeed that our superconducting contacts uh, uh, sustain uh, uh, superconductivity up to magnetic fields in the range of 1.8 Tesla. And so uh, whatever effect we see as a function of magnetic field, we now know is not a result of basically just eliminating superconductivity in the contacts. Now, in order to simplify things and acquire data faster, I'm not going to show you these Fraunhofer patterns as I showed in the beginning, which is the critical current uh, versus flux, I'm just going to take a line cut, uh, let's say at zero parallel magnetic field here, uh, of the differential resistance when we're sending a very small current through the junction. And what you see is basically that when the system is superconducting, the differential resistance is zero, and then at the nodes of the Fraunhofer pattern, it develops a finite resistance. This is the normal resistance, and then it becomes superconducting again, and then it rises again. And so what we're going to look at, we're just going to look at this differential resistance as an indicator whether the system is superconducting or not. We're not going to know from this measurement what the critical current at any flux is, but at least we'll know there is superconductivity taking place. So we're just trying to map out where is superconductivity present as a function of the in-plane magnetic field. And so here you see these kind of differential resistance showing zeros uh, where there is superconductivity and the nodes where the resistance is finite. So this you can imagine in your head just as a Fraunhofer pattern. Uh, and then we're varying the parallel magnetic field and up to something like half a Tesla in plane, nothing really is happening. And by the way, the direction of magnetic field is outlined here. Currently, it's applied perpendicular to the current flow between the two superconducting contacts. But as you increase the magnetic field further at around 1 tesla or 1.2 tesla, we see that there is no superconductivity left. So nowhere as a function of flux can we see a diminished differential resistance, meaning the system is no longer superconducting. But then if you increase magnetic field further, it recovers. And it doesn't recover as strong as it used to be, and I'll give some indications why is that. But uh, the, the surprising thing for us, at least, was that superconductivity restores itself as you increase magnetic field. So it looks like there might be something oscillating as a function of parallel magnetic field in the superconducting behavior of this junction. <laughs>
Now, I mentioned that this was aluminum contacts, and there, there are very few flux jumps, so the Fraunhofer interferometry looks quite beautiful. Uh, here are the results for niobium. Here we can study uh, a larger flux range because the uh, superconductivity is stronger, so critical currents are larger. But basically, you see the same effect. You see that the Fraunhofer pattern that you observe at zero magnetic field slowly vanishes and then disappears at about one Tesla, but then recovers again and then disappears again. And in fact, uh, if you just saturate the colors a little bit more, you see that it actually reappears again and disappears again. So this supports this notion that there is something oscillating as a function of parallel magnetic field uh, in this device, and that's what we'd like to understand. Here you can see just a line cut trying to detect what is the lowest resistance for any one of these cuts here. And indeed, you see superconductivity. It's lost uh, at this roughly one Tesla range. Then it recovers. It's lost. And then it comes back again and lost again. And note, here the resistance is really not zero. So I'm not arguing that we see supercurrent. But we believe that if we would to eliminate all noise in our system and cool the system even further below the temperature that it's being measured, uh, we believe that this will become down and will demonstrate superconductivity. So it's just an indication that the system wants to behave superconducting in this regime. So now we can explore this behavior not only as a function of parallel magnetic field, but also as a function of density. And so we're taking these kind of Fraunhofer's at different cuts, either as a cut at a finite density as a function of magnetic field. This is what you've seen already. But here are some cuts where we fix the parallel field and just scan density. And you see, for example, in this particular case, that the central lobe is too finite, which is what you expect for a conventional Fraunhofer interference of uniform current flow. But as the sample depletes, it actually recovers a simple interference, a cosine interference pattern. And this is actually the signature of the quantum spin Hall effect that I'm not going to talk about. I'm just pointing it out. This is something that we've studied in the past. What this diagram is showing us is the reconstruction of where the lowest resistance of the system is as a function of gate voltage density and magnetic field. And you see that uh, this entire region here of magnetic field and density is strongly superconducting. The resistance is zero. Then it goes away along this kind of yellow. This is normal. This is normalized to the normal resistance. So you see that uh, you recover normal resistance. And then superconductivity reappears in this place here and this place here. It's, there is a little bit of tendency towards superconductivity between these two pockets. And this regime here, I'm not going to talk about. This is the regime of the quantum spin Hall effect when the bulk is actually depleted. So the question is, what is giving rise in particular to this node? And what is the general picture behind this, uh, this thing? If we repeat the experiment with the niobium contacts, one could see a very similar behavior. Again, this is just the lowest resistance normalized to the normal resistance. And you see as a function of density and magnetic field, again, the reappearance of superconductivity here. And it actually reappears a little bit here. That's this, uh, this uh, pocket at high magnetic field. Uh, and we uh, I've just pointed out that the aluminum device maps onto this parameter space in this corner here. You see that it's a very similar behavior in this corner. What we don't see in the niobium device is this particular pocket, but we definitely see this one very much extended up to very high densities. I also want to point out that the boundary between these two pockets of superconductivity is not just dependent on magnetic field, but it depends on both magnetic field and density. And the question is, what is the origin of that? So in order to get some insight to what is going on, we need to address the band structure. And I already alluded to uh, the fact that the system that we are exploring here is an inverted system. Namely, we have holes in the conduction band. This will become very, very important because the G factor of the holes is very strongly anisotropic, uh, that of the electrons as well. But in particular, the G factor, the in-plane G factor of the holes, uh, because they're composed of spin 3 half, the in-plane G factor of a pure hole state is 0. So it's hard to understand in that limit why the magnetic field is doing anything. Uh, but that is only when the density is absolutely zero. As you move away from zero density, you see that the, electro the states become mixtures of electrons and holes. And so they do acquire a g factor. <clears throat> 
All right, so this system has been studied uh, quite extens extensively, uh, uh, originally by uh, Bernavig, Hughes, and Jang. Uh, and what I'm going to be discussing is an extended version of this model that takes into account the various effects of spin-orbit interaction. So the bulk, just the band structure effect without spin-orbit uh, interaction in the system has this kind of shape. You see that it's mostly a Dirac-like Hamiltonian, linearly dispersing, dispersing with momentum, where A is the Fermi velocity. Uh, there are some mass terms that correspond to the uh, opening of the gap. That's the gap in the semiconductor, and the mass can be negative. That corresponds to the inversion of electrons and holes. Uh, but the important terms that I'll be focusing on are bulk inversion asymmetry. So that's a Dresselhaus type spin orbit interaction shown here where the angle theta, I'll spend some time later talking about it, but it's basically the angle uh, that is the angle between the momentum directions that we're con considering and the crystallographic orientation of the sample. Uh, so for Dresselhaus, that angle matters. Uh, this is the Rashba spin orbit term, structural inversion asymmetry due to some electric field in the system. Uh, and finally, just the Zeeman effect. And here I've indicated what the g-factor matrices looks like uh, for the Zeeman effect. And note that, first of all, uh, when the magnetic field is applied perpendicular to the quantum well along the z-direction, all four g-factors exist, but they're very different for the electrons and holes. And the parallel component of the g-factor, you see it's a very sparse matrix. It indicates that there are only matrix elements that take the electron state, which is a spin half to a spin minus half, and they do not couple at all the whole states, which are 3 halves to minus 3 halves. And this, again, is important uh, to factor in. All right, so let's, let's take a look at this band structure. Uh, in the absence of spin-orbit interaction, it just looks like a parabola or something that actually is uh, you know, more straight. It's, it's nearly a Dirac-like cone at high energies. Uh, if you include... The spin-orbit interaction, of course, the Fermi surface splits into two Fermi surfaces, and here I've outlined what happens with Rashba spin-orbit interaction. Note that the spins orient themselves in the plane in the absence of a magnetic field, and you have two Fermi surfaces. Uh, and with the bulk inversion, the Dressel house, the way the spins wind is uh, in the opposite direction to the uh, structural inversion asymmetry, so you get patterns that look like that. Again, the Fermi surface is split, uh, and depending on the angle th theta, the crystallographic orientation, you get different types of uh, orientation of the spins in the plane. Uh, I don't want you to focus too much on the bulk inversion asymmetry because experimentally it turns out that it's a weak effect and we don't really see it. So the main effect that I'd like you to consider is the uh, Rashba spin orbit and the Zeeman case. I already mentioned that the G factor in this system is zero at the band bottom because it's a purely hole-like state. And then this G factor in the plane increases up to the bulk value uh, as the momentum increases in the plane. OK, so so far this was just the single particle properties of the system. Now what we want to consider is what happens when we're trying to pair uh, electrons on these Fermi surfaces as induced by the superconductor. So we're trying to induce some singlet states. And uh, the problem is that once there is uh, the spin-orbit interaction, you see that what pairs are basically, uh, an, so this is pure Zeeman. OK, so let's imagine we don't have any spin-orbit interaction. We're just considering Zeeman. The Fermi surface is, of course, split. One corresponds to the spin along the field, and one corresponds to the spin opposite to the field. So that's the spin arrangement. And if we'd like to pair electrons in this case, Note that we would pair one electron from the outer Fermi surface that has a spin up, and the other one from an inner Fermi surface that has a spin down. But note that that pair now has a finite momentum. It's not centered around zero. Similarly, its counterpart, the down-up version, has the opposite momentum. So the wave function begins to acquire an interesting phase, uh, and, uh, and we're going to explore the implications of that phase. I want to note that this kind of physics is very similar to what happens in superconducting ferromagnetic superconducting junctions, uh, where their Zeeman effect effectively exists due to exchange interactions. But I want to point out that in this system, the nice thing, of course, is that you can tune the magnitude of that effect. It's not just fixed by the exchange interaction. Uh, 
I also want to mention that this kind of finite momentum pairing is something that is being discussed in the context of FFLO states. Uh, here, it's not an intrinsic effect that we have uh, a, a pairing amplitude with finite momentum, uh, but it's the induced superconductivity that has the finite momentum, but very much an analogy with the FFLO state. So that was the case of, and also I want to point out that in the case of Zeeman, note that the momentum of the pair is always in the direction of the propagation of the electrons. So every, and every pair here has momentum, uh, and uh, it's always aligned with the direction of propagation of the electrons. Now let's consider the case of spin-orbit interactions, strong Rashba spin-orbit. So in the case of strong Rashba, it's very easy to see that the application of an in-plane magnetic field uh, shifts one Fermi surface relative to the other in a way that's perpendicular to the direction of the magnetic field. So again, what happens now, spin-orbit interaction wants to pair electrons within each Fermi surface because the spins are winding, so we have opposite spins within the same Fermi surface. But the application of magnetic field now shifts one Fermi surface relative to the other, again generating a phase. But note, this phase exists only for electrons moving perpendicular to the magnetic field, whereas for electrons moving along the magnetic field, uh, there is no net momentum change because the Fermi surfaces are just moving transversely one with respect to the other. And finally, I'm going to skip uh, the effect of the bulk inversion asymmetry. It basically has similar features the pairs acquire a finite momentum as a result of the uh, shifts in the Fermi surface. All right, so in order to understand what is the implication, what, how does that affect superconductivity, the critical currents in this device, uh, one can try to consider the situation where uh, one has a tiny speck of superconductor at point x1, and one wants to know what is the induced pairing amplitude at a point x2. So uh, the pairing amplitude at point x1 would have some, uh, some magnitude delta corresponding to the superconductivity of aluminum, let's say. It has some phase that's given by the phase of the superconductor itself, as well as the phase that has to do with the applied magnetic field in the z direction, the weak flux that we're using in order to modulate the interference. So that's what appears here. Uh, and then we need to consider how that order parameter decays in space as we move from point x1 to x2. And what that uh, entails is this kind of Green's function that has the phase of the Cooper pairs as they propagate along the trajectory from x1 to x2. So phi is just the uh, overlap, the dot product of the shift in momentum, the momentum that the pairs have acquired along the trajectory from x1 to x2. And if we want to know what the overall energy functional of the system. So at point x2, it's going to be just the order parameter lambda 2 times the induced order parameter at point x2, which is lambda 1 times this Green's function f. And so the nice thing is that this phase of the Cooper pair enters this Green function in a very simple way that we can then analyze semi-classically to uh, get some, assess, get, get a feel of how critical currents should look like in the presence of the magnetic field. So let's consider the case of only structural inversion asymmetry. Remember, when we apply the magnetic field, in this case, along a particular direction, the Fermi surfaces move perpendicular to the direction of the field. So momentum now is only acquired along the y direction. And what this means is that regardless of what trajectory we're taking here, the phase is always the same. It's just delta ky times w. Doesn't matter whether the trajectories are diagonal or not, it's always delta kw. So this turns out to produce a term that factors out of the energy functional, and therefore the current, as well as the energy, is modulated by this cosine term delta k times w. And this is very much analogous to what we're observing. So here is a calculation based on that uh, simple semi-classical theory of how we expect the critical currents to depend on the parallel magnetic field for the given width in our device. And indeed, we see that there is an overall cosine dependence, and this is the node of that cosine. Superconductivity goes away 
there is a destruction effect here and then recovers again and that's exactly what one is seeing here. So this happens at high densities. With the Niobidium device, we can look to higher magnetic fields and I want to point again, it doesn't look very much yet uh, similar to one another, but nonetheless this reappearance, there is one node here, another node here, and the simulation for the ideal case shows this kind of periodic behavior, just this cosine factor that factors out. And this oscillation is a direct manifestation of the momentum acquired by the pairs as the n-plane magnetic field is applied. I also want to point out that one can look at the order parameter as is being induced by one contact and one can easily see that it is oscillating in space and one can understand this kind of nodes simply as having the width of the device corresponding to the place where the order parameter vanishes. So not only in principle one can explore this as a function of magnetic field which changes the period of this real space modulation of the order parameter, in fact one can study devices with different dimensions for a same field and one would then see again the same kind of oscillatory behavior uh, because this order parameter is now oscillating in space. For this particular uh, case, the application of magnetic field in this direction and spin orbit interaction, you see that the spatial dependence of the orbit parameter is only oscillating along one axis. However, if we look at the Fraunhofer patterns somewhere at lower density, we see that they, they have a slightly qualitative difference, and that is that the central lobe disappears, but the side lobes don't. Remember that here, uh, it actually looked pretty nice in the sense that all lobes more or less disappeared, both center and side lobes. At low density, we see something a little bit different. Central lobe disappears, side lobes do not. And it turns out that that can be generated if one forgets about spin-orbit interaction and includes only Zeeman. In the case of Zeeman, remember the momentum acquired is always along the trajectory, so every path here has a different momentum uh, and has a different path length. And if one factors this kind of phase factor in the Green's function, in this energy functional, one can compute what the interference pattern should look like. And indeed, you see that the central lobe disappears, but the side lobes do not, and they basically fold into the center one very much like we see here. So what we believe is going on here is that at low density, where Zeeman dominated, spin orbit somehow is not so important. At large density, spin orbit is dominating, uh, is dominating the physics. Just to contrast the two spatial dependence, when we only had the spin-orbit interaction, I mentioned that the order parameter is oscillating in space only in one direction. For the Zeeman case, it looks like the order parameter is oscillating in two directions, both along uh, perpendicular to the contact, but also parallel to the contact. And these oscillations parallel to the contact are induced by the edges of the semiconductor. Without edges, those would not exist. It's really an edge effect. Okay, what happens now if we rotate the direction of magnetic field? So, so far we've applied the magnetic field in this direction. Let's apply it now in this direction and again consider only Rajba spin orbit. So when we apply magnetic field in this direction, Fermi surfaces move perpendicular to the magnetic field, so the momentum is in this direction. So note that a trajectory that now goes straight, the shortest trajectory, the one that contributes most, does not acquire a momentum at all or a phase difference. But all side trajectories do. And again, it's very easy to run the calculation and see what one expects. In this particular case, the Fraunhofer patterns should split, uh, and the order parameter in space is oscillating only as a function of uh, parallel to the contact due to the, due to the boundaries of the sample. Uh, one can understand this splitting very simply as uh, if you recall that the Fraunhofer pattern is a Fourier transform of the current distribution. Note that when the order parameter has this kind of oscillation, the current distribution along this device is oscillatory. And this gives rise to this finite momentum, effectively, in the Fraunhofer interference patterns. And I want to point out that we very clearly see this kind of V-shape Fraunhofer's, but there is a big problem. And the problem is quantitative. Whereas before, there was actually a quantitative agreement between the BHZ model 
and, uh, and our data. Here, note that the scale here is 6 tesla on the simulation and is 600 millitesla on the measurement or even less, 0.15 tesla, to get the same kind of slopes. So there's a big discrepancy here. And unfortunately, it turns out that there is another mechanism that can give this kind of V-shaped behavior that is not very interesting. So I'm going to spend just a minute on it. Uh, when you apply the magnetic field in the direction along the current flow, the superconductor screens the flux a little bit. And so you see you get some per penetrating flux in the Z direction that's pointing upwards on one side and downwards on the other side. And it's very easy to show then that under these conditions, the kind of phase factors that are generated by these fluxes give rise to exactly the same kind of V-shape. And in this case, you can easily get the scale to produce this V-shape on a lower field scale. And the true effect of spin-orbit interaction in this particular case is to split the V. And that is something that we're not seeing at the moment. It's a very subtle effect, and uh, it's very hard to see. I want to also point out the asymmetry between positive and negative flux. Note that these things are not symmetric, and I don't have the time to talk about it, but it has to do with lack of rotational symmetry uh, of 180 degree symmetry of the device itself. If the device had 180 degree symmetry, these V shapes should have been perfectly symmetric. But once we understood this kind of screening effect, it has also bearing on the, magnetic, on the field effect uh, when we apply it in this direction. In this direction, you see that we don't have this effect because the screening takes place here and here, so we don't have this kind of flux focusing. But if the edge is a little bit jagged, it will produce some random fluxes, random phases along the edge. And again, it's very easy to include the random phase. So if you just add some random phase and recalculate what the interference pattern should look like, uh, you see that the lowest field lobes remain more or less untouched. The next node is strongly centered around zero flux, and the third one begins to be very dispersed, just like we're seeing here. So what we believe is that we're very s clearly seeing the signature of this finite momentum, real space uh, dependence of the order parameter, plus some uh, unfortunate phase randomization that exists because of the jaggedness of the contacts. And that jaggedness is only on the scale of nanometers is enough to produce this kind of effect of these large magnetic fields. Uh, next, I'd like to address the boundary, this node. So in the context of this picture, this is uh, in the picture of the strong spin orbit interaction. This node corresponds to the simple condition where the induced momentum of the pairs, delta k, times the width of the device is just pi over 2. And it's not hard to see that the induced momentum is just given by the ratio of the Zeeman energy to the Fermi velocity. It's just the shift of the, of the parabola with respect due to the Zeeman effect. The fact that the node here, this condition, is moving to higher field means that at low densities, delta k becomes smaller at the same field, and we need to increase the field in order to recover the interference, this node condition. So again, we can go back to the theory and calculate the g factor, the Fermi velocity, and the induced pair uh, momentum at different magnetic fields. And indeed, it has this dependence that I mentioned. There is a large induced pair momentum at large density, but that pair momentum is dying off. And note, it's a complicated thing because the G factor is zero, but also the Fermi velocity approach is zero. How exactly the ratio depends is a detail, and this is the outcome. You see that there is less momentum induced at low densities, which means we need a larger magnetic field in order to generate the node, and that's what these dashed lines are. These dashed lines are the theory uh, that tell you where the node should be as a function of density. And you see that at large densities, they fit very nicely. We don't understand the behavior in this low density regime. So with this, I'd like to uh, summarize, as my time is up, and, let, and just uh, uh, conclude that in these two-dimensional systems with strong spin orbit, the in-plane magnetic field uh, controllably induces phase shifts uh, uh, momentum, uh, momentum in the pair, in the pairing, uh, in, the, in the Cooper pairs, uh, 
Uh, and the order parameter that is induced in this system oscillates in space in some very interesting direction. And in fact, one could use this kind of understanding to generate a particular uh, behavior, zero pi junctions, et cetera, simply by engineering the position of the second superconducting electrode. And uh, I mentioned that at large density, we understand that this behavior, this momentum-induced pairing is primarily due to spin-orbit interaction, but at low density, it looks like it's just Zeeman dominated and the effect of spin-orbit interaction is weak. That, let me thank you. Thank you very much.